Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump into it. Um, this isn't a particularly long one, so it won't take up the whole time here, but uh, this is basically a pilot study uh, that uh, I did complete and, and I'm just going to kind of walk through here. So, um, this is the title here, Deconstructing Hegemonic Narratives with Scholarly Contextualization Methodologies and Cinematic Pedagogy, which is a really jerk way of saying watching film like a historian. So I always love putting all this like random jargon up here that doesn't really say anything complicated, uh, but it always gives that, that you know, deer in the headlights look at first. Now, I want you to film like a historian. So I'm your presenter, uh, Matt Stevenson, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, um, the Theory and Practice and Teacher Education Department, the focus on social studies. Um, if you're interested, I do have this QR code. I'll put it up again at the end uh, where all my presentations uh, are recorded, as you can see. Uh, and are posted, uh, so if you want to watch some of this later. I also have other presentations uh, that are recorded that are all up there. All of, oh, well, sorry, most of them deal with film. Uh, that is my area of expertise and my area of research, is the use of film in social studies classrooms, which, for the most part, is not done well. Uh, not across the board. So what this project is, basically, uh, is taking off of Samuel Weinberg's uh, study of thinking like a historian and just applying it directly to film. So that's what we're doing here. If you're interested in that subject here, uh, the QR code is available for you. Okay, so um, the overall agenda here is to provide a brief literature review. I'll probably skip the literature review part, maybe just a couple highlight points. Uh, but on the practice of using film in the secondary classroom, uh, once again, it tends to not be good. It tends to just be showing the film and being like, okay, there you go. Uh, so this is more about seeing how actual historians at the college level will be doing that. Uh, we will be outlining uh, an ongoing research project in the use of film in college history classrooms, which again, why do historians use film in their classroom versus a comparison with secondary teachers, which the secondary teachers has not been completed yet. Uh, and then um, I did put this, uh, the interview that took place into a vignette. Uh, I'll just give you some samples of the responses of these historians uh, when they were asked about use of film in the classroom. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of demonstrations for that, so for the purposes here. Uh, the overall research questions, uh, in what ways do historians utilize mainstream cinema for instruction? So we are talking about feature films, uh, things that students would likely have to come into contact with outside of the classroom. How do historians employ that when they do? Uh, what do college level histor uh, history professors expect from their students when engaging with film? Uh, and then what implications could this have for informing the use of film in college equivalent secondary classrooms like advanced placement or IB or something along those lines? as a tool of the cultural curriculum. Uh, to real quickly define that idea, the idea of the cultural curriculum is the understanding that people actually bring to the classroom before instruction begins. So have students seen these films before? Or have they seen films on various topics uh, that are gonna be discussed in the social studies classroom? Um, I just did a presentation, um, actually right before this, on um, civil rights era based films, so like Selma, Hidden Figures, um, uh, Green Book, uh, those are films that students could very likely have seen before they walked into the classroom, and that would be their cultural curriculum. They already have an understanding that is not refined by the academic curriculum. Uh, so, uh, the idea of this study is to see what the implications could be. In other words, this was my code, uh, this created my code book for when I go and I interview uh, high school teachers and how they are utilizing the film. Okay? Uh, and again, the implications here, college history classroom practices must translate to college equivalent classrooms. If we're going to have AP and IB, then they better be doing what actual college level courses are doing, otherwise what is the point? Okay. Um, these are again the, uh, the major influences uh, in my literature review, there's obviously a bunch, bunch larger studies than this, but these are kind of the big theoretical frameworks here. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all the details, but the real terminology that's necessary is Hayden White's uh, concept of the meta-history. Uh, meta history is, a uh, meta historical narrative, excuse me, um, is the idea that history is created every day in the classroom. I, as the educator, don't hold the keys to, to history and history stories that I've been bequeathed to my students. Um, instead, the historical narrative is formulated through classroom discussions, incorporating both academic and the cultural curriculum together. Uh, and Hayden White, in particular, who is a historian, uh, focuses on the concept of implotment. Uh, and plotment, which is a word he completely made up. That's the fun part about our profession. We can make up words whenever we want. Uh, but the idea of implotment, uh, that this is the idea of, of placing a narrative in somebody's mind or helping them to build that narrative of a historical situation. And films are excellent for that. Uh, they may be inaccurate. They may be problematic. Um, but the, the, the idea of the historian and therefore the social studies teacher needs to recognize the, the mechanisms that create that implotment for the meta narrative in order to address that through discussion. 
Watching a film that is problematic is not a problem as long as the discussion addresses those issues. That is the, the necessary aspects of the Hayden Weiss plot. And of course, all this, uh, the, the inspiration of the education historian, uh, sorry, education researcher, uh, Samuel Weinberg, speaking like a historian, who better to tell us about how history would view this than actual historians. So that's what the interview process went through. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the Foucault stuff because that's, that's a lot more jargon that we don't need, or at least for today. Okay, so the methods for the study um, was a semi-structured series of interviews. Uh, the questions are actually in the manuscript itself. There's a question list there. Uh, that were then, uh, the manuscripts were then put through a series of deductive and in inductive coding. This is all pretty common stuff, right? This is very typical for our profession. Um, but to actually go through and see, okay, what exactly are they saying? And then uh, what, once you see what they are saying, we form that dead code book that then goes and says, okay, what are the commonalities between these? And that's the second step. Um, and then the results were presented in a narrative vignette. These interviews took place separately, but I weave them together as if it was a conversation, uh, as if they were actually talking in, say, a focus group or something like that about their use of film in the classroom. Actually, I've completed the manuscripts on this particular pilot study. It's going to now inform and continue to utilize this code book when we translate this uh, to looking at the second. This is necessary for engagement. Now, why that is might be disagreed, but every single historian interview did use film at some point in their classroom. Uh, the use of film uh, inversely correlates, I know it's an incredibly loaded term because I didn't actually do any statistics on this, I just like the terminology again, uh, correlates to the confidence of students' abilities. If a history professor does not believe their students are doing well, or that they're an institution where their students are, are um, engaged with, uh, with um, a primary source text, then they're less likely to use film. They'll still use it, um, but they don't trust their students to interpret it, in other words. And so if they don't trust it, then they're, not likely, they're less likely to use it. Uh, the implotment, or again, forming that narrative, exists in many forms and is effective for instruction. Even those who hesitate to use film still recognize that giving that sort of feeling, that narrative aspect to it, um, is effective for their instruction. And there's a diversity of methods, of course, these are very diverse professors, uh, that uh, all do return to a common theme, which is contextualization strategies. Uh, in other words, they never just show a film and let the film speak for itself. They want to talk about not only what the film is representing, but when the film was produced, about how it should be interpreted by a modern audience. Uh, this is something very common for the, again, watching film like a historian. Okay, so the participant criteria. Um, first of all, they are established historians. Um, as established historians who are all full-time faculty in history departments with multiple professional publications, they are experts in their fields. In other words, I think like historians. Right, that's pretty clear, right? Um, they also have all participated in advanced placement readings. So in other words, these are professors who have gone to advanced placement readings, this is where I meant these people, uh, and therefore they understand, or so, uh, as current and former AP Raiders, uh, they have knowledge and experience with college level material being translated for college equivalent high school use. So while they are professional historians, they understand AP kids, right? They have a concept of, of what those kids would, would need uh, that is similar and different from their own students. Uh, and these are all colleagues and friends. These are all people that I've worked with, uh, gosh, decades uh, in all these cases. Uh, and they are, they are definitely friends, which uh, helps to establish a, a collegial um, um, atmosphere of mutual respect and a friendly rapport. It was pretty easy to establish because it was already there. And of course, I represent them uh, respectfully, I suppose is the best way to put this. Uh, so here are our participants, uh, Naomi, Jack, and Joseph, pseudonyms, of course. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll get into their engagement here. So the themes that were consistent uh, with these three particular participants in their interviews, uh, first of all, is that our students need help, right? Which suggests that's not really surprising. I mean, if, they, if the students knew everything, then why are they in the classroom in the first place? Uh, but I think a big part of it is also they don't feel that their students are being prepared at the high school level for what they're dealing with at the college level. Again, that's not shocking, right? Uh, most professors are going to have that feeling, oh, my kids in front of me don't know anything. Um, but a lot of it, again, does have to do with the complete misperception about what history is supposed to be. History professors do tend to want to teach history methods more than they want to teach historical facts. Uh, and that does not necessarily translate to the high school level. Uh, the concept of the text or context is, in fact, always their main purpose. Uh, they much prefer that people can interpret text, watch a film, and know what they're engaging with uh, and they can put it into context rather than memorizing the facts that the film is trying to produce right, or trying to demonstrate. Uh, that's the key aspect, again, to think like a historian. Um, 
In all cases, if they use film, there better be a good reason. Uh, this is a big one here because it's, it's a common trope or stereotype uh, that a lot of, well, really any K through 12, I, I focus on high school, but K through 12, when they use film, it's because it's Friday. Or they use film because the substitute teacher is going to be there. Well, let the substitute show this. Or, you know, the Sunday, or sorry, the Monday after the Super Bowl or something like that. Uh, we all know what that could mean. Uh, but historians don't look at it that way. Uh, if, they, if they think the film's going to be a waste of time, they don't use it. Um, but if they do utilize it, there better be a very good reason for this. And, of course, even at the AP level, uh, the, the teachers with, as we say, good intentions might not necessarily know the strategies for this and see it as a way to, to demonstrate film but not engage with it. Uh, and of course, film is that excellent source of implotment. It puts a narrative in people's minds in a way that almost no other medium can do. Or it's difficult to achieve with other mediums, is the better way to put that. Okay, so let's meet our participants here. Uh, first is Naomi. Uh, so she describes her experience uh, as follows, or her professional acumen as follows. Um, she says, I've been at my liberal arts institution for the past 19 years. My position is technically a modern Central European historian. Uh, and it's an undergraduate institution, so uh, I teach the first year seminar, actually I teach two, uh, one of which is on Freud's Vienna, uh, the other is 20th century European dictatorships. I teach 100 level survey on a co course of modern European history. I teach upper level courses, lectures and seminars ranging from intellectual, political, and social history of Central Europe, uh, the history of nationalism, and stuff like that. I'm a trained German historian, uh, and my first book uh, was on the migration into and out of Germany during World War I. Uh, my, sorry, it's very, really very much a Weimar book. I just published a book on American urban history, but I think my next project is actually going to be something slightly different, which is right now intellectual history of the Enlightenment. Um, it's a little hard for me to narrow research speciality. I guess I would generally say I'm a modern historian, uh, and I think of myself as an intellectual historian. So really, just to demonstrate, uh, this particular participant has research interests all over the place, mostly Europe. Uh, but of course, obviously, American urban history as well, uh, and she just kind of goes with whatever inspires her. But she is working at a liberal arts institution which focuses on undergraduate instruction. So perfect for exactly what I needed uh, for this kind of research. Okay, second is Jack. Oh, sorry, back up for half a second. Uh, happy is an excellent way to represent her, especially when it comes to the use of film. Okay, so going to Jack. Uh, Jack is... All right, so he describes his experience as follows. Uh, I've been full-time faculty for the past 10 years at various uh, HBCUs, so historically um, black and sorry, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, the courses I teach on a regular basis are the second half of American History Survey and the two halves of African American History Survey. Right now, my primary course is called African American Experience, which is essentially a melding of the two halves of the survey into one, and then there's a civil rights course thrown in there uh, for, more, uh, for a more specialized course. Uh, but the primary courses I instruct, uh, oh, sorry, these are the primary courses that I instruct. My research focuses mostly on the long civil rights movement. Uh, well, when you get really specific, I look into ways in which the civil rights movement has been powered through cultural aspects, athletics, film, music, television. Uh, for instance, I look into the activism of African American athletes, going all the way back to Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens, through Jackie Robinson, uh, Muhammad Ali, and all the way up to Colin Kaepernick in the present day. So, you know, people think of the civil rights movement as beginning with Brown versus the Board of Education. The long civil rights movement takes a wider chronological look at the civil rights. Uh, and I would consider, it's starting with, say, Booker T. Washington or W.B. Du Bois. Uh, it's really something that continues into 2022 when, when these interviews were done. I would say 2023, of course. Okay, so that is Jack. And Bashful is um, the only way to describe his use of film because he's anything but uh, any other personality. But his use of film, I think, that's a good representation. And this guy, who I really like to pick on, uh, all friends of mine, by the way, which is why I get to pick on them this way. Okay, so, uh, with Joseph, uh, his, uh, he describes his experience as follows. I've been in my current institution uh, for the past 19 years as department chairperson. I've fallen into places where I'm trying to plug the holes. Uh, he is at a uh, small Catholic university, by the way. So we have a, uh, a liberal arts college, uh, an elite liberal arts college to describe it, an HBCU, and in this case, the Catholic University. <clears throat> I teach a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't actually get to repeat my courses very often. I would say that the ones I do every year are because of requirements. I do the seminar in history. I do historical methods and historiography. I teach public history courses. Uh, it's mostly U.S. for me, um, but uh, in, in particular, colonial U.S., which is my uh, specialization in research. 
So the reason why I read this part of the vignette is just to demonstrate, again, these are well-established, well-experienced historians uh, who do all focus on teaching undergraduates. Right? None of these actually deal with graduate students, which is, again, best for translating uh, into the college equivalent courses. Let me get through these details here. Okay, so the takeaways from the three interviews that took place before I do kind of get into a little more example of their specific use. Uh, Naomi is excited about the use of film. Uh, when I was discussing the use of film, she jumped right into it. I mean, they all knew what my project was going to be, but we always started with, again, your background and so forth. But it seems she uses film as often as she possibly can. She loves to put the stuff into her classroom, uh, really thinks that the engagement factor is very important. Uh, but she only wants to use primary source examples. And I'll give you an idea of what that is here uh, in just a moment. In other words, she's not showing a film uh, that is about a time period. She's showing a film from the time period that she's utilizing, which of course you have that benefit if you are a modern historian. You can't do that if you are teaching colonial America, for instance. Uh, Jack is much more hesitant about using cinema in place of primary sources. Uh, he, uh, he does, however, have very unique ways of using a lot of sources. Uh, while he does use uh, actual cinematic films for the purpose of this presentation, I want to show that he, how he actually turns a primary source into a secondary source, which is really tricky. Because the other way around seems to make sense. Okay, if you're going to show the film Selma, it's a secondary source about those events or a primary source of the movie itself. Well, he reverses that. He takes a typical primary source and actually makes a commentary about a previous era, which I'll show that demonstration here in just a moment as well. Uh, Joseph does not like to use film. That's why he gets to be grumpy. And again, his personality is anything but. It's only his perception on film. Um, but he does recognize its power for the purpose of implotment, for the idea of, again, putting this narrative into people's minds. He, he will utilize film for those purposes. Uh, okay, so uh, the, question, uh, the, the question that comes out of these findings is, are secondary teachers thinking like this? Uh, are they thinking about this? Uh, and this is, again, is going to build that code, uh, this did build that code book necessary for the next stage of this research progress or process, which is to, again, interview actual high school teachers and how they use film. Where does it fit in with how historians use it? Now, because I'm the only one presenting, I guess I can continue with the rest of this because we are not short on time. Okay, so here's an example here uh, from Naomi uh, and her utilization of film. As I mentioned, she's used, utilizing films as primary sources specifically. So in this case, uh, she's talking about her teaching of Weimar Germany, where she describes as, a follow, as follows. If I show them a film from the 1920s, and what I want to talk about is, as an example, the film Nosferatu, which is 1922, by the way. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, but it's this really creepy, early hard, basically Dracula, right? So 1921 or 1920, so it's super early, right? And what's interesting about this film is this kind of German approach to the East, the way in which they frame Romania as, as a source of danger. And they talk about the Russian Revolution and love. Uh, that's something that, if you don't know anything about it, like my students might know about the Russian Revolution, that it happened, but they probably don't know about this sort of context. So what she's describing here is she wants to teach a lesson on Weimar Germany, and she takes a completely uh, fantasy yeah. film, or science fiction, or horror film in this case, that, again, clearly the film Nosferatu, a Dracula-style movie, has no actual historical representation other than this is a film made in Weimar Germany in the early 1920s. Their paranoia of Russia, their paranoia of what's happening in the Russian Revolution and communism comes out in the making of this film. A classic example of film being utilized as a primary source only. Okay, so Jack, uh, when he teaches his lesson on Malcolm X, as I mentioned before, turns a primary source into a secondary source, which again, is something I didn't expect to, to come across uh, in, in this sort of structure. And I would certainly utilize that if I teach a US history class again. But his description, in this case, involves uh, an a, um, interview with Malcolm X of 1963 uh, on a uh, television network show called City Desk. Right? This is based in Chicago. So his description is, when I get to my section on Malcolm X, I use this City Desk appearance when I am teaching about the transatlantic slave trade and the manner in which slavery ripped people of African descent away from their past, from their identities, and from their true selves. So I don't use it so much as a demonstration of Malcolm X, but more so as a way to discuss the cultural legacies of the transatlantic slave trade. So that's one of the first videos of any kind that I show in my class uh, that I teach each semester, which usually begins with Africa and the African slave trade. I do provide context for them, there's that word constantly, context, uh, for them before I play it. I let them know that this is an appeal uh, that a civil rights leader, Malcolm X, made on television program in 1963, and that he's going to be speaking about what he sees slavery as having done to the African-American identity in specific. 
So again, typically you would expect somebody to show a Malcolm X interview and be teaching about the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But what he's done is he's taken that primary source and made a commentary about 150 years before this. Malcolm X, uh, with the, uh, the title of this interview is uh, Our History Was Destroyed by Slavery. This is how he introduces the transatlantic slave trade, a pretty nuanced way to understand the source material and to present this to students. And Joseph, who is determined that he doesn't like to use film in the classroom, still lights up when he talks about it. During the discussion, he can't help but get excited when he starts thinking about the details of what the film actually does. So despite his veneer of being grumpy with this, uh, once he gets into it, he's anything but. So when, he finally, uh, when I finally did get him to talk about a particular film, he says, there are snippets, and we're talking like two, three minute snippets that I think bring in, uh, bring in emotion, emotion, that's in plotment right there, uh, to certain really pivotal moments, such as the film To Kill a King. The execution scene is ridiculous. The people, now he's describing the film, the people are reaching their arms out and touching his feet, meaning the king, uh, because they think, in reverence, they, they think they're touching God, right? And then he gets to the gallows or, or, or the chopping block, and they chop his head off. You would expect the people to cheer, and they don't. There's this, just, in the film, there's this, because they just cut the head off of maybe God's representative on earth, and they think that they might get struck down. This is... This is the common people who are watching. And then Tim Roth, who plays Oliver Cromwell, uh, puts his hand in the blood and lifts up his palm, his bloody palm and says, look, red like yours. He's just, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but he's just a man. And the people still aren't sure. I play that clip less than five minutes to show the people, you know, show the students that the people aren't so sure. This is a scary moment for those people. I think that's powerful. This is the kind of thing that I was looking for. Again, he uses very short clips but in his mind, it's like there's no better way to represent the feeling and emotion of such a distant time period uh, as 1600s England. Uh, and even though he does continue to insist that I don't like to use film, you can see, and I tried to, my best to put the intonation in there, how excited he gets that his words are getting choppy, his sentences are breaking up because of the passion he has for this particular scene. And he wants to instill that into his students. So that is what this project has, has tried to demonstrate. How do we watch films like a historian? So...